Good day, everybody. Welcome to Rocky Mountain Readings. I apologize for yesterday's uh, stream. For some reason, my restream software would not connect, so I made sure I had every update possible, uh, locked in, logged out, uh, tried to reset everything, and uh, everything seems to be working fine this morning. So we're going to continue uh, with the wonderful book, The Talmud, a biography. Um yeah, uh, yesterday's lesson, I did uh, record it because it was able to stream onto my uh, um, Noahide Society of Canada page, so I did get a recording, and I did upload that to the Noahide World Center. Uh, so day six is available, uh, not as a live broadcast, but as a, an upload, and uh, it was a shortened version. Uh, we talked about uh, the Christian Hebraists uh, that um popped up uh during uh the time of the reformation after the 15th and 16th century um exactly what the uh, the talmud had to face during those that era uh christian scholars decided well they needed to know more and so uh they started to study hebrew and of course uh, uh back at their usual tricks and tactics you know to try to uh uh, uh endlessly um act derogatory towards anything that doesn't agree with them. And, uh, yeah, so today we're going to continue. Uh, we appreciate uh, everybody that shows up uh, to listen in. Um, I enjoy doing these Rocky mountain readings if it's, uh, if it's worth doing and we hope that you folks enjoy it also. Uh, so, uh, yeah, let's jump right in. Uh, today we're on chapter 12, the wisdoms, wisdom of the Greeks, uh, because, uh, after the Christian Hebraists, uh, you'll find very similar uh, arguments uh, that was coming out of uh, after the time of the Reformation, very similar arguments that the rabbis were used to dealing with all the way back into the, the time of the Greeks. Uh, Yochanan ben Zakkai said, if you have a sapling in your hand and someone says the Messiah has come, first plant the tree, then go to greet the Messiah. The Talmud's encounter with the world of Protestant scholarship was only brief. Their paths diverged in the face of new scientific discoveries, new ways of thinking, and from the Talmud side, at least new things to worry about. The Talmud had encountered many enemies, but even those who saw it as an object of contempt to be destroyed and eradicated from human history agreed with its underlying premises that the world had been created by God who continued in some unknowable way to manage its affairs and that the Hebrew Bible was his unmediated word. The Talmud's enemies disagreed with each and every conclusion that its compilers drew from those facts, but the facts themselves were immutable or they had been up till now. One of the incontrovertible facts of God's creation was the way in which the universe operated. The Bible stated quite clearly that heaven and earth were created first, with the sun, moon, and stars coming into existence on the fourth day. Now, I don't hold to that. I hold that they were only revealed on the fourth day, uh, but they were, in fact, created with the heavens along with the earth in the beginning, and that they were only revealed on the fourth day. The, cl the earth uh, clearly stood at the center of God's creation, and any fool could see just by looking at the sky that the, the heavenly bodies orbited it. When Nicholas Copernicus proved from his observations that the earth revolved around the sun, he was roundly denounced by Orthodox Church theologians. As for the Talmudists, most of them were so immersed in their world of study that the news never reached them. Those who did hear mention of it paid little attention. Scientific progress fell into the category of Greek wisdom. It held no interest for them. But even in the most closed societies, there are always a few who are open to new ideas, particularly when it came to astronomy, which had always occupied a special place in the Talmudic world. The Babylonian Talmud, conceived in the ancient birthplace of astro astrological and astronomical study, contains a number of passages which speculate on the size of the heavens, the seasons of the zodiac, and the movement of the stars. Several medieval Talmudists had written ast astronomical treaties. Many Arabic astronomical works had been translated into Hebrew. The genesis of their astronomical interest lay in a practice in ancient Jerusalem. Its high court had been required to regulate 
the calendar by proclaiming that the new moon had been sighted. Witnesses would appear before the court declaring they had seen the new moon, but they couldn't always be taken at their word. Frequently, they got it wrong. They may have mistaken the last appearance of the waning moon for the beginning of the new one, or they could have been misled by a patch of light from the setting sun, reflecting off of a cloudy sky. Gamaliel the second, whom we met in the first chapter, had charts and calculations on the wall of his study showing the shape, orientation, position, and size of the new moon at different times of the year. He would examine the witnesses to see if what they had seen corresponded to his astronomical charts. Nicholas Copernicus had studied at the University of Krakow in Poland. The city would become home to uh, Moses Is- Israels, uh, who, as we have saw, saw, had commented extensively on the Shulkan Aruch. Joseph Carroll's definitive law code. Israels had inherited the Talmud interest in astronomy. He even wrote two treaties on astronomical matters. He had been cited as the founding father of Talmudic astronomy in Poland, placing him at the beginning of a process in which modern technical and scientific discoveries were incorporated into Talmud study. But although Israels lived in the same city as had Copernicus and was in his teenage years when the great astronomer published his theory, he either didn't know about it or more probably dismissed it in his universe. The sun continued to revolve around the earth. But despite his old world astronomical view, he did open up the subject to his Talmudic students. The one in particular was profoundly influenced by what he had heard. David Gans had studied the Talmud under Israels before leaving Krakow for Prague, the seat of the Holy Roman Empire. Rudolf II, Ru- Rudolfine Prague, as it was known, was at that time a sizzling hub of cultural, scientific, and intellectual activity, a place where anyone with a creative talent or an inquiring mind wanted to be. Gans, who took a far greater interest in science than most of his Talmudic contemporaries, came into contact with some of the leading practitioners of the age, including the imperial astronomer Tycho Bray and his assistant Johannes Kepler. Bray and Kepler worked out of an observatory that the emperor had made available to them uh, in his summer place near Prague. On three separate occasions, Gans spent five days with them in the observatory, which contained, according to Gans' account, great and wondrous astronomical instruments that no eye had ever beheld. One of the astronomical passages in the Talmud discusses whether the planets revolve or are stationary. The Talmud records that the sages of Israel abandoned their view that the planets revolved against the backdrop of the sky in favor of the view that the sages of the world, presumably uh, Ptolemy's disciple in, in Alexandria, who maintained that they were stationary but affixed onto a revolving sky. Come on, you. Gans records, uh, records a conversation he had with Bray in which the astronomer expresses astonishment that the Talmud had changed its opinion. Bray told Gans that according to his observations, the rabbis of the Talmud had been right and the other sages wrong. Gans was not the first Talmudist to have questioned the uh, retraction. One of his teachers, Yehuda Lo, known as the Maharal of Prague, legendary creator of the Golem, uh, had already expressed a similar view. The Talmud doesn't explain why it had originally held a dissenting view about the rotation of planets, nor why it reversed its opinion. Rabbi Yehuda, the author of the Mishnah, whom the Talmud cites as the person responsible for the change of opinion, probably considered the new uh, Ptolemaic system to be scientifically correct and could see no good reason for maintaining the old position. If so, his attitude to science in the second century was far more in the spirit world, uh, in the spirit of the world in which Gans aspired to move, a world in the grip of a scientific revolution. 
than those he had left behind in Krakow who ignored Copernicus's discoveries. Shalom, Imam. It wasn't just the realm of theory that the new science challenged the Talmud. New discoveries also affected Talmudic law. The Talmud believed that lice, unlike fleas, do not sexually reproduce. Presumably, it assumed that they spontaneous gener spontaneously generate in the skin or fur the animal in which they live. This belief has a legal consequence. The Talmud forbids, forbids the killing of animals on the Sabbath. But if lice do not sexually reproduce, then they are not animals. So, although it is forbidden to kill fleas, which do sexually reproduce, it's okay to kill lice. Isaac uh, Lepronti, the author of a Talmudic encyclopedia and most celebrated physician theologian amongst the learned, raised this question with his teacher, uh, Judah Briel, since it was now recognized that lice, like all other creatures, were born through sexual reproduction. Shouldn't the law allowing them to be killed on the Sabbath be abolished? Uh, Briel did not agree. One of the reasons he gave was that the rabbis of the Talmud had ultimately been proved correct about the rotation of the planets. They'd been vindicated and should never have given way. The same thing applied here, argued uh, Briel. Modern science had probably got this wrong, just like Ptolemy had. The Talmud's view on how lice re reproduced would, would, said Briel, probably one day be vindicated. The scientific advances which prompted Lepronti's question would change the Talmud's world, just as it would everywhere. But the Talmud had no bone to pick with science. It may have taken it time to adjust to the new discoveries, but science was nothing more than a means of understanding God's creation. A far greater challenge than science came from philosophy, the philosophy of one person in particular. He didn't particularly have the Talmud in his sights, his aim was broader than that, but the challenge was felt by most, most keenly by the Talmud because, as befits the Talmudic paradox, it came from someone who had been reared in its orbit. The first secular European. Baruch Spinoza was born in Amsterdam in 1632 to a family who, like most of the city's Jews at the time, were conversos, recently arrived from Portugal. Most of Spinoza's biographers assumed that he had received an education in Talmud, but as Edward Feld has argued, there is no reason to assume that. As a child, he received a formal Jewish education, and he was well-versed in the Bible and the Hebrew language, but rarely in his writings does he mention, let alone quote the Talmud, only six times altogether, and even in his references, are offhand and careless. It's odd because he is a stern critic of Maimonides' philosophy and of the belief in the divine authorship of the Bible. If he had been familiar with the Talmud, one would expect him to offer a more systematic treatment of it, since it was fundamental part of the system that he was arguing against. Feld suggested that he left school at an early age before he had graduated to the Talmud classes. Nevertheless, whether Spinoza studied Talmud or not, we do not know that he was taught by people who were well-versed in the discipline, and their methods of thought would certainly have influenced his, as did the Amsterdam uh, that he lived in, uh, a wealthy, tolerant city enjoying the golden age of the new Dutch Republic, with its burgeoning worldwide trade and expanding empire. This was the city where Rembrandt was painting, where Descartes had lived, where boats arrived daily from Borneo, Africa, Brazil, and North America, carrying exotic cargoes, strange animals, and precious merchandise. Amsterdam had its dark side, too. The West India Company played its part in the slave trade, populating the plantations of the Caribbean with victims seized from their homes in Africa. E economically prosperous, its elegant canal-sided houses filled with art, sculpture, and fine furnishings Amsterdam was a place of merchants, bankers, artists, and intellectuals. We saw how the political Hebraists had flourished in Amsterdam. It was a city where minds were open to new ideas, and Baruch Spinoza's fertile mind, seeking to forge coherence from multiplicity, was foremost amongst them. Spinoza was a fiercely rational philosopher, who challenged religious thinking and current beliefs in the nature of God. 
he could not accept that there is a divine being who created the, and controlled the world. But that didn't mean he denied the existence of God. For Spinoza, God and nature are one and the same. Uh, as for the Bible, he was the first to maintain that it was the product of human minds conceived by inspired people. The Bible, according to Spinoza, is a system of law and ritual which is, if followed, promises worldly happiness, uh, but it has nothing to do with eternity. Needless to say, Spinoza's theology did not go down well with the Jewish community in Amsterdam. He was excommunicated at the age of 23 before he had even published anything. He spent the rest of his life developing his philosophy whilst earning a living as a lens grinder, a craft which he excelled, but which didn't bring him worldly happiness. The dust which he inhaled as he polished the glass for his lenses killed him before he was 45. Spinoza was a Jew and a philosopher of religion, but he wasn't a philosopher of Judaism. His ideas about God were anathema to both Jews and Christians. Uh, the Talmudic world rejected his ideas and continues to do so today, but it was unable to escape the consequences of his life and thought. By subjecting religion to the new tools of rationalism, he opened up the Talmud to a new form of investigation. That's why he is part of the Talmud story. He separated the realms of reason and ritual and in so doing laid the foundations for 19th century thinkers to construct an academic discipline in which Talmudic texts would be subject to the same forms of analysis and criticism as any other works of classic literature. From this point forward, religious theorists who reflected the new ways of thinking would appropriate Spinoza to validate their ideologies. In time, of, in time a Jewish enlightenment would emerge, which would simultaneously enrich and challenge the Talmud. Uh, the excommunicated Spinoza, who never stopped thinking of himself as a Jew, unwittingly created the conditions for the Talmud's entrance into modernity. He marks a turning point between the medieval and the modern in Jewish religious thinking. Away from the light, <clears throat> the scientific revolution didn't reach everywhere. And it didn't always survive in those places where it did reach. Prague had been a center of scientific innovation under Rudolf II. It didn't last. The devastation of the Thirty Years' War and the victory of the Counter-Reformation marked its demise. A similar discipline took place in Poland. Krakow's reputation for astronomical excellence uh, came to an end. Social inability, instability and the rise of obscurantism impeded the influx of new ideas. The Talmudic communities of Eastern Europe in Poland, Lithuania, and Russia, whose populations had swelled over the previous centuries, knew little of science and even less of the Enlightenment that was coming in its wake. They carried on much as they had done for centuries. All that distinguished them from their Christian neighbors was their faith, their language, and their various customs, including their educational systems, uh, education was considered to be a communal responsibility and was administered accordingly. At its heart sat the Talmud. A communal edict in Lithuania in 1622 required every town or village which was large enough to engage a rabbi to maintain a Talmudic school or yeshiva. Boys, only boys, the modern world was still dawning, would attend yeshiva from the age of 13. Well-off families paid for their son's education, those who could not afford it were supported from communal funds. Learning was meritorious. Students were looked upon kindly in the divine realm, and it was a long-established tradition that those who worked prevented them in the slaughter of a conservative estimate of 75,000 and possibly up to 300,000 souls across a swath of Ukraine and Poland and left behind nothing but a climate of despair and confusion, a populace bereft of hope. The, the Chil Chil Chilniki massacres helped create the conditions for brief success of one of the strangest characters to enter the pages of Talmudic history. A messianic debacle. The Ottoman Empire was the dominant power in the Islamic world. Its borders uh, took in the Baltic states, Greece, Turkey, the whole of North Africa and Arabia. But despite the vast territory it covered, economically and culturally, 
it had long been in decline. The golden age of Islamic philosophy, mathematics, and science was but a distant memory. The Talmudic communities in the Ottoman Empire were submerged in the same state of intellectual paralysis as everyone else. The ancient centers where the academies had once flourished now rarely produced Talmudists of distinction, nor were the Ottoman lands touched by the currents of enlightenment and secularism, which were beginning to flow through Europe. Although the Talmud uh, and the Hadith had developed side by side, scholarly contact between the two communities had all but ceased long ago. Notwithstanding the trade links which formed part of everyday life, Jews and Muslims each lived in their own cultural silos. There was little engagement of any sort between the Talmud and its host communities. The only time they came into any sort of prolonged contact was when the local ruler or another decreed an expulsion or persecution of the Jews in his land. <laughs> Give me, guys. I'm only healing. Nobody foresaw the maelstrom that was about to rip through the becalmed intellectual climate. <sighs> Even now, with the benefit of hindsight, it appears. Quite unthinkable, individual families and whole communities across the Ottoman Empire and Europe were caught up in one of the most phenomenal eruptions of collective del delusion the world has ever witnessed. It was not the result of any external threat, and yet it threatened the Talmud more than any burning or censor's pen had ever done. A Jewish tradition holds that the Messiah will be born on the anniversary of the Temple's destruction, the ninth day of the Hebrew month of Av, Shabtai Zvi, around whom at this episode in the Talmud story revolves, was born on that very anniversary in the Turkish city of Smyrna on the Aegean coast in 1626. His name deriving the Hebrew word for Sabbath suggests that uh, he arrived in the world on a Saturday. We don't know whether the child's parents thought that the date and day of his arrival was important, but as a young student of the Talmud and Kabbalah, he gained a reputation as an inspired man and attracted a circle of enthusiastic followers around him. Zvi suffered from an extreme form of bipolar disorder. He was prone to profound fits of melancholy and states of great elation. In 1646, when news of the, the, the Chlemniki's slaughters in Poland reached Smyrna, Zvi heard a voice proclaiming, him the savior of Israel. Over the next few years, his behavior became increasingly erratic. He married three times each time he refused or was unable to consummate the marriage and divorced his wife within a few months. He repeatedly proclaimed himself as Messiah, engaged in bizarre pseudo-cabalistic rituals, and publicly pronounced the forbidden mystical name of God, the mention of which had always been treated with the greatest gravity. It had only been ever been enunciated once a year in a state of great awe and solemnity by the high priest in Jerusalem's temple. Since the temple's destruction a millennium and a half earlier, no one had uh, dared utter it. Shabtai Zvi publicly, behavior publicly challenged the authority of the Talmud. As he ritually desecrated religious law, he would utter what was to become his trademark blessing to God who permits the forbidden uh, by all accounts, Shabtai Zvi, who at times was charming, charismatic, and blessed with a beautiful singing voice, could be wild and frightening. He and his dark moods became more frequent. People stopped seeing him as a benign fool and began to regard him as dangerous. Eventually, he was forced to leave Smyrna. He began a period of wandering during which he seemed to return to a calmer frame of mind. He ended up in Jerusalem, where he heard about Nathan of Gaza, a young man of whom it was said that he could reveal the secret root of a soul and provide a Kabbalistic formula for its cure. Shabtai Zvi, still convinced he was the Messiah, traveled to Gaza to meet him. When they met Nathan, he was quickly won over to the belief that Shabtai Zvi was indeed the Messiah. Shabtai, for his part, was overwhelmed by Nathan's gift of prophecy. Within just a few months, Shabtai's personal delusions 
brought to public attention by Nathan, remarkable PR skills were to spread throughout the Jewish world. Communities in Poland and Russia, so recently traumatized by the slaughters perpetrated by uh, Chimniki, now rejoiced. The, the Messiah had arrived. Salvation was at hand. Elsewhere in Europe, North Africa, Arabia, and the Near East were the reports of the massacres had where the reports of the massacres had been an ominous omen from a foreign land. People counted themselves lucky not to just have lived far from the slaughter, but to have been born in the generation when the long-awaited Messiah had arrived. They were in no doubt. 1,500 years of exile and suffering were drawing to a close. Shabtai's V's messianic claims, the enthusiasm of his supporters and the fierce opposition he engaged, engendered, had a devastating impact. The faith of those who believed the, the promises of a new utopian world would have been touching where were it not so misplaced. The dismay of their friends and relatives who saw their beloved ones succumbing to the madness, often casting aside their livelihoods and possessions to chase mere dreams and promises, turned to rage as the disillusion spread. Families and communities were torn apart. Those who believed in Zvi regarded those who did not as infidels. The Talmud was abandoned in favor of mystical practices, its laws repudiated or reinterpreted to meet the demands that Zvi placed upon his followers. In many small communities and villages, the Sabbatean movement swept up the entire population. In Amsterdam, one of Zvi's most committed opponents, Jacob uh, Sesportis, believed that the infidels were in the minority. <coughs> Over, <coughs> overwhelmed by those who followed Shabtai, <coughs> in the Yemen, the isolated and mistreated Jewish community gave up their trades, donated all their possessions to charity, and prepared to travel to Jerusalem for the long-awaited ingathering of the exiles. Similar stories were reported from Germany, Poland, Morocco, and the Papal States, even in staid London, which was recovering from the Great Plague of 1665. The news was met with joy. Not everybody lost their heads. They didn't all believe in Shabtai V and Nathan his prophet. This was a man who publicly profaned the law to prove his messianism. That wasn't how it was supposed to be. Granted, the Talmud had said that the Messiah would be proclaimed by a prophet, but that prophet should have been Elijah. Even if one could stretch a point on his identity, who was to say that Nathan was a prophet? It was well known that the age of prophecy had ended long ago. In Amsterdam, Jacob Sesportis pointed to the passages in the book of Deuteronomy which warned against false prophets. A true prophet could only be known according to biblical and Talmudic tradition if he performed a miracle or if he made predictions that came true. In either case, a court of law had to verify the facts. Private testimonies were not enough. Since no court had ever verified Nathan's prophetic ability, he didn't make the grade. And if he was no prophet, then there was no evidence for Zvi as Messiah. Indeed, Nathan had effectively admitted as much. In stark contrast to the Talmudic view, he had insisted that neither he nor the Messiah would prove themselves by performing miracles. They demanded nothing less than pure faith. Yeah, it's always the way with the phony, isn't it? Shabtai Zvi had first met Nathan in early 1665. At the end of that year, he prepared to travel to Istanbul, capital of the Ottoman Empire. Reports had already reached Istanbul that a new king of the Jews had arisen and that his followers were preparing themselves for the advent of the Messianic era. The excitement had spread beyond the Jewish population. The entire city was gripped by a carnival atmosphere. The imperial authorities, authorities who were well used to putting down insurrection and revolt opened their armories. Zvi journeyed from Gaza through Syria, remaining for a few months in his hometown of Smyrna before setting off for Istanbul. On his arrival in the capital, Shabtai Zvi was arrested and cast into the most uh, foated dungeon the city could offer. It could have been worse. Many expected him to be sentenced to death. Bribes were paid, and eventually Zvi was transferred to a more spacious prison, where on the eve of Passover he sacrificed a lamb, a ritual as it could only be performed in the Jerusalem temple, had long been abrogated. He made his customary blessing to he who permits the forbidden. 
On September 16, 1666, Shabtai Zvi was hauled out of jail and brought before the Sultan. He was given a choice of death or conversion to Islam. Everyone assumed that Shabtai uh, would opt for martyrdom. What, that's what self-proclaimed messiahs were expected to do. Instead, he chose to convert. The Sultan was delighted. This was a prize catch. He gave Zvi a royal pension. His followers were thrown into utter disarray. Reaction to Shabtai Zvi's apostasy was mixed. Many refused to believe what had happened, or if they believed it, they saw events as part of some great messianic plan. In Turkey and Hamburg, it was believed that he had ascended to heaven and it was merely his likeness which remained behind. Yeah, the stories, just like Christianity, start to form. A handful of his closest followers followed his lead and became Muslim. Their descendants make up the, the, the Donme sect in Turkey today. With the benefit of hindsight, we can see that the Sabbatean outbreak, hysterical as it may have been, was no more than the product of its times. Messianic expectations were rife in Europe and across the Mediterranean. In Britain, millenarian beliefs, which John Gray places at the heart of the Reformation, had by the 17th century spawned radical Messianic groups like the Ranters and the Fifth Monarchy Men, who, taking their name from the prophecies of the book of Daniel, were preparing for the second coming. Matt Goldish has demonstrated close parallels between the belief in Shabtai V and the growth of utopian movements, including the Quakers and the French prophets. In time, of the, in time, the majority of those who had been taken in by the Shabtai delusion returned to their former lives, and the Talmud resumed its place at the center of religious life. But it wasn't to the, the end of the story. Shabdai Zvi may have converted to Islam, abandoned his messianic pretensions, and lost most of his supporters, but the movement he inspired didn't disappear overnight. It simply went underground, with its tentacles still protruding. Many Sabbateans disguised their affiliation, living outwardly as normal members of the community and practicing their sectarian rites in secret. Ay, ay, ay. The Challenge of the Enlightenment. The baptismal certificate is the admission ticket into European civilization. That was Heinrich Hein. After the storm, Shabtai Zvi's death 10 years after his conversion led to a flurry of speculation among some of his former fans. Traditionally, the Messiah could only be a descendant of King David's royal line, but the Talmud refers in passing to another Messiah, a descendant of the Bible's multicolored robe, Joseph, who would be slain before David's descendant could assume his role. When Zvi died, some of his former followers assumed that he must have been the Josephite Messiah and that his death was part of the great divine messianic plan. A further brief flurry of utopian expectation swept through Bohemia. Over the years, the anti-Sabbatean environment turned nasty. Sabbatean prophets continued to circulate, preaching a message of ultimate redemption and Talmudic rejection. The Talmudic establishment launched a counteroffensive, rooting out suspected closet Sabbateans from amongst their own number. One of the best known and most antagonistic confrontations erupted between two highly regarded Talmudic scholars, Jacob Emden in Germany and Jonathan uh, Ebezich in Prague. Jonathan uh, Ibezic was widely regarded as one of the greatest Talmudic authorities of his generation. A child prodigy, he became head of the yeshiva in Prague in 1725, was one of a group of rabbis who formally excommunicated the Sabbatean movement in the city. The author of many highly regarded works of Talmudic law, he was on track for a glitter glittering career, rapidly moving from one senior rabbinic post to another. When he was accused of being a Sabbatean himself, his congregants and students refused to believe it. Um, Ibishit's chief accuser was Jacob Emden. Emden's father had battled the Sabbateans in Amsterdam, and his son now took up the, the, the uh, cudgel. But Emden, an outstanding Talmudist on his own right, in his own right, had also been uh, Ibishit's rival for the post of rabbi of the third three communities of Hamburg, Altona, and uh, Wandsbeck. <clears throat> the confrontation began with a book that had appeared in 1724. 
The work promoted a quasi cabalistic view that was seen as heretical to traditional belief and which accorded with the Sabbatean mystical doctrine. The Sabbateans themselves claimed the work as one of their theirs and named uh, Ibeschutz as the author. Ibeschutz denied any involvement, but suspicions were not fully allayed. Even when he took part in the Prague excommunication of the Sabbatean movement, 13 years later, when Jacob Emden opened some amulets that Ibeschutz had written and found that they contained Sabbatean material, the controversy flared up anew. The Talmudic world was divided. Accusations and counter-accusations flew. There was scarcely a Talmudist in the world who could remain neutral. There were calls to dispose Ibeschitz as rabbi of the three communities. He was obliged to appeal to the king for support. The monarch ordered fresh elections for the rabbinic post. Ibeschitz was confirmed and his post in his post, but the question mark over whether he was really a follower of Shabtai V never went away. His cause was certainly not helped when his son declared himself to be a Sabbatean prophet. Hey, hey, hey. Jacob Emden didn't emerge from the dispute happily either. Many people blamed him uh, for fanning the flames of a controversy that should have been left to simmer quietly. He fled to Amsterdam where he spent the next few years publishing legal texts and works dedicated to denouncing Sabbatean Kabbalistic doctrines particularly publications which he considered to be propaganda to win over yeshiva students. An odious redeemer. After all that had happened, <clears throat> the age of messianic pretenders was still not over. It wasn't long until a far more sinister contender emerged in the person of Jacob Frank, a follower of Shabtai V, uh, though without the charisma. As a young man, Frank had been initiated in the Sabbatean movement and had spent time with a branch of the Don May sect of Sabbatai V's followers in Salonika. Following a pilgrimage to the grave of Nathan of Gaza, Jacob Frank returned to his original home in Podolia, Poland, where he rounded up followers, preached a message of anarchy and thinly disguised hedonism and sought to abolish the Talmud altogether. Jacob Frank boasted that he knew nothing of the Talmud. He described himself as an unlearned man, but it is clear from his letters that he was familiar with the Bible and Kabbalah. He may even have known a little of the Talmud. One of Frank's, one of occasion, on one occasion, a group of Sabbateans under Jacob Frank's directions were discovered holding a secret ritual, an interpretation of a mystical Sabbatean ritual of human marriage with the Torah. They danced unclothed around a naked woman adorned with the ornaments of a Torah scroll. The villagers who stumbled across them at the climax of their right were horrified. They informed the Polish authorities. The participants were arrested. Jacob Frank fled and his followers were put into prison. Now that they had been outed as Sabbateans, Jacob Frank's followers began to hold rituals publicly, hoping to win recruits from the mainstream Jewish community. The local rabbis asked Jacob Emden, who, as a result of his publications in battle with uh, Jonathan Ibeschitz, had gained a reputation as an anti-Sabian Sabbatean activist. What they should do. He suggested that since new religions were forbidden in Poland, the rabbis should ask for help from the church to curtail the Sabbatean activities. But Jacob Frank was no fool. He outflanked the rabbis. Twenty-one of his followers prepared a manifesto in Latin, a language well understood within the church, but wholly alien to most Talmudists. The manifesto alleged that the Talmud was blasphemous, contrary to reason and against the divine commandments. They submitted their pamphlet to the bishop, called themselves contra-Talmudists, and claimed that they had been persecuted, excommunicated, and falsely accused. The church saw a two-pronged opportunity. Potentially, the Frankists could be a valuable weapon in the church's century-old crusade against the Jews. And handled properly, there seemed to be a good chance that Frank's followers might be converted to the Christian faith. Oh, they never stop. The Frankists position, petition the church to order the rabbis to attend a disputation. A key topic would be the validity of the Talmud. The rabbis, aware of the Talmud's history, had a pretty good idea where this would end up. They managed to resist for a full year. 
Finally, after extreme pressure from the bishop, they gave in. They turned up to debate in uh, Kamienic, where they were horrified to be confronted by a Frankist contingent containing several of their own colleagues, who it turned out had always honored secretly Sabbatean beliefs. Oh, backstabbers. On the 17th of October, 1757, the bishop decided that the Frankists had won the debate. He ordered the Jewish homes to be searched and all copies of the Talmud confiscated and burnt. The burnings took place in November 1757. On the ninth of that month, the bishop was suddenly then ill and died. Everybody, Frankist, churchmen, and rabbis saw it as an omen. The burning ceased, the Frankists took fright, and Jacob Frank fled with many of his followers to Turkey, where, following Shabtai V's example, he converted to Islam. Meanwhile, those of his followers who had remained in Poland turned back to the church. They remained the ecclesiastical authorities of the promises and uh, authorities of the promises of protection the deceased bishop had given them. After some discussion, the king issued a decree of royal protection. When Jacob Frank heard of it, he shrugged off his con conversations to Islam, his conversion to Islam, and returned home. Now that they were able to live openly, Jacob Frank told his followers that it was time to follow a new path. This would involve rejecting all forms of law, but only in secret. Outwardly, they were to convert to Christianity. He provided a mystical justification for all this, then tried to make a deal with the church. He would present himself and all his followers for baptism, but only on condition that they would, could continue to live as a separate sect with their own rituals. He also demanded a further opportunity to debate as contra-Talmudists with the rabbis. One of the themes was to be the old charge of the blood libel, the accusation that the Talmud demands that Jews use the blood of Christian children for ritual purposes. Yeah, and we read about this uh, from the Maharal of Prague's, uh, uh, the, the wondrous deeds of the Maharal and the Golem. Yeah. The blood libel had been undergoing something of a revival. The number of trials of Jews accused of ritual murder in Poland had been on the rise since the Counter-Reformation in the 1560s. In 1710, uh, Jan Serafinowicz, a Jewish convert to Christianity, had published a book in which he claimed that the Talmud instructs Jews to desecrate the host, uh, the sacred bread used in the Mass, to def deface Christian images and to use Christian blood in their rituals. But Serafinowicz's Sarah, Sarah book didn't have the effect he desired. The Bud libel trials had begun to attract attention, the wrong, the wrong kind of attention in Rome and in Protestant Europe. The Middle Ages were over. Church leaders no longer believed the myth of the blood libel, and there was little sympathy for Jacob Frank's attempts to revive the charge. As far as the church was concerned, the man was becoming an inconvenience. The dispute Frank asked for did eventually take place, but nothing much came of it in 1759. Jacob Frank, who had been born a Jew, had converted to Islam, rescinded his conversion, and then founded his own religion, was baptized along with thousands of his followers into the Christian faith. The Talmud was to hear no more of him. A free spirit. <clears throat> Many in the rabbinic camp saw the conversion of Frank and his followers as a tremendous victory. One man deeply regretted it, regretted it. He may even have died of pain because of it. He was no Frankist, and he was certainly no enemy of the Talmud. But he saw Jacob Frank and his followers as part of the mystical body of Israel and their apostasy as the equivalent to, of the amputation of a limb. His name was Israel Baal Shem Tov, meaning the master of the good name. He is usually referred to by his initials. The Besht. He is known as the founder of the deeply ritual spiritual Hasidic movement. He is one of the three men born um, in the early 18th century, which, with radically different worldviews, each of whom would have a seminal and enduring influence on the story of the Talmud. The Baal Shem Tov was born into a world in which magical events regularly occurred and wonder working rabbis, masters of the name, traveling from village to village. 
They were able to heal the sick, write ambulance, and exercise demons. But whilst the Baal Shem Tov was capable of this and much more besides, he was no ordinary miracle-working mystic. Yes, he could prophesy the future, reveal to people their previous incarnations, and understand the healing nature of plants. But what set him apart from all other wonder-working rabbis was his ability to touch souls, to bind himself up inextricably in the needs of others. It was his charisma, rather than any seemingly supernatural powers, which drew people to him, which created a circle of followers around him, which resulted in a hagiography of stories, legends, and fables, reverently passed down amongst his acolytes. The Baal Shem Tov inspired the mystical, life-affirming movement that became known as Hasidism. It wasn't the first deeply spiritual movement to emerge in the Jewish world, but it took hold like no other. It still flourishes today, 300 years after the, the Besht, perhaps even stronger than ever. The Besht was uh, a man of the people. This comes across clearly in the many tales in which he is found uh, talking to innkeepers, traveling with wagon drivers, wandering through good followers to him. It also brought him the first generation of his followers into conflict with those Talmudists who were not drawn to the lifestyle he advocated. One of the fiercest critics of Hasidism, David of Makov, who married in the year that the Baal Shem Tov died, described him as an ignoramus, a writer of amulets who didn't learn because he wasn't able to learn, who walked through the streets and markets with a stick, pipe, and tobacco. Uh, we shouldn't reach read much into these words. David of Mako was a polemicist, and, and couches his criticism of asceticism in extreme terms, even appearing to find something shameful about sticks, pipes, and tobacco. Uh, but his description of the best illustrates the depth of resentment that developed between the Hasidism and the mainstream. Whatever David of Mako said, the Baal Shem Tov and his followers were deeply religious people, and they held fast to all the basic principles of their faith including the virtue of study, but the way they studied was not the way it was done in the Talmudic colleges. The Talmudists studied the Talmud as a duty and an intellectual exercise, analyzing and challenging its arguments, peering beneath its many layers to determine the theological roots and practical applications of religious law. The Hasidim saw something else in Talmudic study. Their ultimate goal was to elevate the soul to a mystic state of union with God. This could be achieved through complex spiritual exercises, but also, also through simple joyous activities like dance, song, and study. As one of the best follow, followers puts it, when they learn Gemara, or Talmud, they clothe themselves in great fear, trembling, terror, and awe of the Holy One. Their Torah, or learning, lights up their faces. When they mention the name of Atana or any of the Talmudic authorities, they imagine that person standing alive in front of them, illuminated by the heavenly chariot. When they emerge from their learning, miracles and wonders happen to them. Just as in earlier generations, they heal the sick and bring down benevolence upon all Israel. The traditional Talmudists, many of whom were not averse to mysticism themselves, had little interest in this sort of approach. They wouldn't have denied that studying the Talmud was a religious activity that brought spiritual reward, but their prime motivation was to understand the law, not to become mystically enriched. Hasidism emerged and expanded rapidly in those parts of Poland, which were home to the dissenting uh, Raskol community, which had broken away from the Orthodox Church half a century earlier. Raphael Eliak believes that the Besht was heavily influenced by this community and may have even spent his formative years amongst them. She sees parallels between their rituals and those of the early Hasidism, for which they were roundly condemned by their opponents. These included dressing in white, whirling dervish-like dances in which they waved white handkerchiefs, feasting on anniversary of parents' death and allegiance to deeply, a deeply spiritual leader. There is no doubt that some of the early Hasidic practices were very alien to traditional Talmudists. It seems that they even worried some of the Hasidic leaders themselves. 
a 19th century Hasidic leader, Menahem Mendel of Lubavitch, paid tribute to those Talmudists who had fought bitterly against the early manifestation of the movement. Had it not been for those battles, he claimed, the Talmud would have been scorched by the fire of Kabbalah and slowly edged its way away from the Talmud. Practical observance would have become worthless in the face of the intense fire of mystical introspection. In particular, he singled out one man, Elijah of Vilna, the fiercest of all their opponents, and without a doubt, the greatest Talmudist for many generations uh, for particular thanks. That was the Vilna Gaon. The Gaon of Vilna. The title Gaon hadn't been used much since the days of Baghdad, but it had not disappeared altogether. It was still applied occasionally to people of such sharp intellect that the designation rabbi, which means teacher, did them no justice at all. Elijah of Vilna, or Vilnius in Lithuania, was one such man. He wasn't a community rabbi. He didn't head up a college. He didn't even really have any students in the usual sense of the word. The only people who studied under him were mature, respected scholars in their own right. He'd been a child prodigy, delivered a sermon in the local synagogue at the age of six, and answered probing questions on it. He spent his life in endless study, shut away from the world, rarely sleeping for more than half an hour at a time, and for no more than two hours in total during a night. It is said that he spent his nights in an unheated room with his feet in a bowl of cold water so that he would stay awake. He had unrivaled command of the Talmud and its associated literature and of Kabbalah. They called him the Vilna Gaon. The enthusiasm which greeted Hasidism in its heartlands in Polish Ukraine wasn't repeated in Vilna. It was a populous city regarded as the intellectual center of the Lithuanian Empire. We got a good Noahide group there in uh, Vilnius. Yeah. Its universities was one of the U Europe's most respected institutions of learning. The majority of its inhabitants were Jews, and even though they were excluded from the university, they shared the city's temperament for culture and scholarship. They regarded the mystical exercises of the rural Hasidism as frivolous. That's not to say they ridiculed mysticism. The Vilna Gaon was, was as immersed in Kabbalah as he was in Talmud. But for the mysticism was a route towards intellectual understanding, not to spiritual ecstasy. Very important. Elijah was an implacable opponent of the Hasidicism. He saw the Hasidim as a deviant, heretical sect. Um, as far as he was concerned, their uh, panentheistic belief that God was in everything conflicted with the traditional view of both the Talmud and the Kabbalah. Elijah condemned the Hasidim for their, their attitude to Talmud study and its place in religious life. The highest of all value, virtues for Elijah and his followers, who became known as the Misnajim, or opponents, was a life devoted to Talmud study and the lifestyle it demanded. The Hasidim didn't deny the value of Talmud study, but it was just one of several potential routes to mystical ecstasy. Alongside prayer, joy, and devotion, the dispute between the Hasidim and the Vilna Gaon hinged on which was the correct form of religious worship, study of the Talmud, or prayer. This might seem uh, trivial to modern secular minds, but all organized religions had had divisions at some point in their history. Some have had them through the whole of their history, often starting with apparently minor matters. These disputes can escalate to a magnitude that is unfathomable to anyone not caught up in them. Religions are conservative institutions, and in a conservative world, all change has the power to threaten. The traditionalist had not forgotten the Sabbatean and Frankist affairs, 
They had no wish for anything else that disturbed their time-hollowed worldview. When Elijah was born, Vilnius was recovering from war. Its wooden dwellings had been ravaged by fire and its population decimated by plague. As a young man, he would have fretted with the other Jews as the citizens of the town petitioned to have them expelled as a consequence of the king's gift to them of trading rights. But by the time he reached middle age, the city was recovering economically. Low infant mortality was boosting the population of both the Jewish and Catholic communities, and a new spirit of tolerance abounded, brought about by the encroaching Enlightenment. The church, under the leadership of Bishop, Bishop uh, Masolkiski, stopped seeking converts and even drove away those who sought voluntary apostasy. Vilna's Jewish community became large, thriving, and confident. The vast majority were opposed to the Hasidim. In the city, they had the numbers and the civic uh, autonomy to do something about it. In 1772, they launched a fierce and uncompromising campaign against the Hasidim. Hasidic leaders were arrested, imprisoned, and excommunicated. Their writings seized and burned. Hasidic gatherings were prohibited. The Besht was dead by now, but two of his most prominent followers, Schneur Zolman of Liadi and Menahem Mendel of uh, Vit 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 Vitebsk, traveled to meet the Vilna Gaon. They wanted to explain Hasidism to him to defuse the conflict. The Gaon refused to see them. Not only was he unwilling to compromise, he didn't even want to give the impression that he was open to dialogue. The leaders of the Vilna community recognized that in Elijah they had a rare and valuable treasure in their midst. They took it upon themselves to support him. They paid him a stipend that far exceeded that of a, the communal doctor and was nearly as much as that paid to the judge. Some people objected. Communal funds came from taxation, and many felt that they were already being taxed too heavily without taking on the support of a reclusive scholar. Complaints began to be hurled at the leaders of the community, and in particular, one man, Abba Wolf, a staunch supporter of the Gaon. In 1787, Abba Wolf's son, Hirsch, walked into the local monastery and asked to convert to Christianity. The monastery took him in, notwithstanding Bishop Masolsky's uh, strictures. His father was distraught. Abba Wolf went to see the Gaon, Elijah, Together, they concocted a plan. They bribed another con convert to Christianity to befriend, befriend Hirsch in the monastery. They gave him a large sum of money and asked him to win Hirsch's trust. Eventually, when Hirsch was confident his, in his new friend, they went for a walk together. Hirsch's brothers were outside waiting. They grabbed him, dressed him in women's clothing, threw him into a carriage, and smuggled him out of the city. Five days later, the local authorities arrested Elijah and Abba. Elijah refused to answer to any of their questions and was sentenced to 12 weeks in Gaol. He was imprisoned for the festival of Sukkot when Jews leave their homes and live in a temporary dwelling as a reminder of the Israelites wandering in the wilderness. Being in prison, Elijah could not fulfill the obligation of sleeping in the temporary hut. Those incarcerated alongside him reported that for the whole week of the festival, he placed, paced up and down in his cell holding his eyes open so as not to be guilty of the offense of sleeping in the wrong place. Wow. Elijah Vilna's legacy was not his battle against Hasidism. That was merely something he felt he had to do. His personal contribution to the life of the Talmud was intellectual, and his influence was most likely most keenly felt in the world of Talmudic education. <coughs> He had an encyclopedic command, not just of the Talmud itself, but of all the sources that lay behind it and the commentaries and law codes that had emerged from it. Unlike those earlier Talmudists who had rejected the wisdom of the Greeks, Elijah of Vilna saw the value of science and mathematics, albeit as a way of gaining a better of understanding Of the Talmud. Important. He even he even encouraged one of his students to translate uh, Eleusid, the classic master of geometry, into Hebrew, all in a, 
in all his system of study was far more methodical and analytical than his forerunners. He laid the foundations for a new rigorous approach to Talmud study, one which would be developed further by his outstanding discipline, Chaim of Volosian. Yes. Well, from the point of view of both the Hasidim and their opponents, the struggle uh, had not been good for the Talmud. It had become neglected, a victim of all the quarreling and in, and infective. Chaim of Volosian bewailed the fact that in the villages, the communal study houses were full of books. 200 years earlier, Jacob Landau had published a book of Talmudic riddles. He asked how, how two people could each be the other's uncle without any incest having been involved. Many people agreed that this approach, often described as hair splitting, denigrated the Talmud. It was a way for students to show off their sharp wittedness, but it wasn't the substance of serious learning. Chaim wanted something better. He raised funds from people who supported his efforts and established a yeshiva in his hometown of Volozhin that would be financially independent. He abandoned the hair-splitting methods of Talmud study and introduced the methods which characterized uh, Elijah of Vilna's approach, in which analyzing the text and understanding its plain meaning were paramount. He created a round-the-clock system of study so that when one group went to bed, another group arose. His educational system laid the foundation for the modern Talmudic college. In time, the struggle between Hasidism and the opponents played itself out. As we saw earlier, Menachem Mendel of Lubavitch acknowledged that Hasidin, Hasidism had been saved from its own excesses by the strictures of the Vilna Gaon and his allies. Uh, a modus vivendi was achieved. There were bigger battles looming. The winds of enlightenment were starting to blow in from the west. This was no time for the two camps to irrevocably fall out particularly as they were about to face a new and, to the religious mind, far more insidious threat, albeit as yet unacknowledged, it was the threat of secularism. Cookie Monster, how are you? The Seeds of Emancipation The Jews were a confident, secure majority in Catholic Vilnius, not so 500 miles away in the Protestant city of Berlin. Not that there were persecuted to any degree. After all, Berlin was the heartland of religiosity, religiously tolerant enlightenment. Indeed, full emancipation was on uh, offer to the Jews. All they had to do was convert to the Lutheran Church. <sighs> they weren't under pressure to do so. Nobody was burning their Talmuds, but who could choose to remain in a tiny minority, just 3% of the population, with few political and civil rights? when they could become fully emancipated into a tolerant, reasonable, enlightened majority. Con conversion, so the Lutheran reason, Lutherans reasoned, was a small price to pay. Such reasoning didn't go well uh, with Moses uh, Mendelssohn. As a young man, he had studied the Talmud, German literature, philosophy, the classics, and the modern languages. He made a name for himself as a philosopher. Unusually for a Jew, he had many friends in the German literary, literary world and was accepted into cultural salons frequented by Berlin's Protestant intelligentsia. As a philosopher, Mendelssohn owed a debt to Spinoza. Culturally, Spinoza had helped create the conditions that spawned Mendelssohn's thoughts, thought and allowed it to propagate. Religiously, however, Spinoza caused him a problem he tried to divorce Spinoza's philosophy from his attitudes to religion. He admired Spinoza the philosopher, felt sorry for the fate of Spinoza the religious heretic, and condemned those who had hated him. For many years, Mendelssohn concentrated on his philosophical philosophy, writing in both German and Hebrew, albeit for different audiences. <clears throat> his reputation grew and grew. He became known as the, uh, the German Socrates. He kept away from religious disputes until the day in 1769 when he was confronted by a Lutheran clergyman, uh, Johann uh, Kaspar Lavater, who had translated a philosophical Calvinist work into German. Believing that this work made out an irrefutable case for Christianity, Lavater challenged Mendelssohn's 
either to publicly refute the work or else do what Socrates would have done if faced with an irrefutable truth. In other words, concede the argument and convert. Mendelssohn was far from convinced by the arguments in the book Lavender had translated and was deeply hurt by the personal attacks hurled at him, which intensified as the argument continued. He realized that, as the Yiddish proverb put it, he could no longer dance with one backside at two weddings. Uh, as the Protestant intelligentsia would never fully accept him as an accultured German philosopher, whilst he simultaneously remained intellectually wedded to Talmudic tradition. The Jews would always remain suspicion of, suspicious of his loyalties while he held himself aloof and supp supped at Berlin's coffee houses. Mendelssohn knew he had to reconcile his two positions. His response was twofold. He began to involve himself in the growing calls for the political emancipation of his people, arguing for a pluralistic society for minorities to have full rights and an equal voice in German society. And he looked for ways to encourage the Jews who, for the main part, still lived outside the city in rural Yiddish-speaking communities to appreciate the value of the secular German culture, to speak its language and absorb its literature. He wrote a translation of the Hebrew Bible into German, which he based on the Talmud's interpretations. He wanted to offer Jewish students a literary German alternative to the rather wooden Yiddish renderings that had used uh, been used up to now, an alternative which was more substantial than the current Christian translations, which, by ignoring Talmudic interpretations, failed in its view to draw out the full meaning of the text. Mendelssohn's Bible translations, translation was based on Talmudic interpretations, but was far more than just that. He tried to create a synthesis between traditional religious faith and modern scientific reason. He wanted to harmonize contemporary science and philosophy with traditional Talmud and Bible scholarship. His German translation was originally published using Hebrew characters, but was very quickly reprinted in German script. It became hugely popular amongst both Lutherans and Jews. Subscribers to the first edition included professors, pastors, and nobles. The subscription was even taken out in the name of the King of Denmark. Mendelssohn's use of Talmudic tradition exposed his German readers to new ways of understanding the Old Testament, and it showed his Jewish readers that they had nothing to fear from examining their own heritage in the German language. Mendelssohn is a key figure in the Hashkala, or religious enlightenment movement, an important aspect of which was to integrate traditional Talmudic and religious thought with modernity as part of a process of cultural fusion and political emancipation. Not everyone approved of it. Many traditional scholars railed against what they saw as an assault on their time-honored way of life. Mendelssohn and his colleagues had as many opponents amongst their own people as they had amongst proselytizing churchmen. But for every thinker who disapproved of his agenda, there was another who eulogized him. <clears throat> when he died at the age of 56, after a life of ill health, over a thousand people, Christians and Jews, crowded into the tiny cemetery. Shops in Berlin closed out of respect. Newspapers discussed his final illness. His doctor held a press conference. His friends swapped tales about him and quoted his best-known sayings. A friend and foe alike saw him as a giant on the historical stage, either a hero or a villain. He either saved the Jews from medieval obscurity or dangled them over the yawning chasm of secularism and assimilation. It all depended upon your point of view. All his admirers wanted a piece of him. He became, in Shmuel Feiner's words, a pawn to the partisan of various agendas, each waving him like a banner and adopting him uh, for their worldview, which, if nothing else, must be a treatise to his greatness. Moses uh, Mendelssohn wasn't Spinoza's disciple, but they do have something in common. They each stand at an important crossroad among the same road in the Talmud's encounter with modernity. 
of the three and 18th century figures who brought the Talmud into the modern world, the impact of the Besht and the Vilna Gaon is readily discernible. Even if today the boundaries between their respective groups of followers has become somewhat blurred, at least from the outside, each in their own way ensured the continuity and uh, vibrancy of Talmudic life. The picture with Moses Mendelssohn is more complex. In many ways, he took on a far greater challenge. The Besht and the Gaon, in their very different ways, inspired their followers. Mendel Mendelssohn uh, sought to put in place a huge cultural shift. He didn't wholly succeed. Some of his children converted to Christianity, including his son Abraham, father of the composer Felix Mendelssohn. He became, uh, as David Sorkin put it, a legend in his own lifetime and a symbol thereafter. And I think we'll call it a day there. Uh, and tomorrow, or not tomorrow, um, this uh, next Tuesday, we'll be back with the problem uh, with emancipation. So this week I'm scheduled on for uh, uh, Chapter 2, Mishnah 11 with Rabbi Chaim Kaufman. And also uh, back this uh, Saturday, uh, with Rabbi Aaron David Post, and um, we're going to continue with Tomer Devora, uh, starting the first chapter of Tomer Devora. We have did a one episode in that uh, book on the, uh, he did an introduction on it a few weeks ago, and I look forward to being back with him. And I'm tentatively also back on Sunday for uh, Genesis class with Rabbi Chaim Goldberg of the Noahide World Center, and also our... Um, Working Together series with Rabbi Carmi Ingber from uh, Atlanta, Georgia area, uh, working with our friends down in Nativ in Houston, Texas in their Zoom room. So those will be going on uh, Saturday and Sunday this week uh, after uh, Shabbat ends in, in Jerusalem and in Israel. Um, and the rabbis are clear. Uh, so we will be doing that Saturday uh, and uh, Sunday as well. And we'll be back Tuesday. I've got to start working all night tonight. Um, so it's a joy uh, to always share in the wonders of uh, Torah. And I find this book has been just wonderful so far, giving us the mile markers of history over the timeline that the Talmud has actually gone through. And, and you can see repetitive uh uh, opposition uh, return uh, over and over and over, but uh, still, I, Hashem, uh, it stands, and uh, I think we're getting closer to the modern uh, era. So, uh, okay, we're going to sign out of Rocky Mountain Readings for today, but we'll be back Tuesday with Rocky Mountain Readings for Part 8 in the Talmud, a biography. We'll probably finish this in the next couple of days. Uh, it might take us uh, the three days next week, but we will be taking in stride. If anybody's got a suggestion for where to go next, we want it to be interesting, but I'm sorry I had the, the broadcasting problem yesterday and uh, probably just one small thing that for some reason it would not connect with uh, the Noahide World Center uh, page or YouTube, uh, uh, but I did get to broadcast it on my uh, Noahide Society of Canada page. And uh, yeah, so uh, we're going to sign out for now and we'll be back. Uh, with more Rocky Mountain Rings Tuesday. Shabbat Shalom, everybody, this week.